All right, our next presenter today is Dominic Coletti, uh, presenting on the Basnight Bridge. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, everybody. Um, so I'm going to talk about the Mark Basnight Bridge, and I, I titled this presentation, Designed for Durability in a Challenging Environment. It'll make a little bit more sense in a minute as we get into things. Um, we're going to look at both the old Bonner Bridge and the new Mark Basnight Bridge, kind of side by side. And as we go through this presentation, we'll follow this outline. We'll begin by asking a basic question. Why are we building a bridge here? And it'll make sense in just a minute. After that, we'll take a look back in history at the old Bonner Bridge. Um, and I've titled that as unintentionally less durable. I don't mean to be casting any aspersions against the original designers, and that'll all make sense in a minute as well. After that, we'll talk about the Basnight Bridge and how it was deliberately designed for durability in this very harsh marine environment. And then we'll wrap things up with a quick summary. So we wanted to begin by asking this basic question. Why in the world are we building a bridge here? And if you think about it, this is kind of a crazy place to build a bridge. We're basically building a big, long bridge between two sandbars right on the Atlantic Ocean. We must have been nuts to think about this, both back in the 60s and today. Um, but there's reasons why we did this. And the answer to that question comes down to three main parts. The first is the, the uh, mantra of the realtor, location, location, location. This is a great location. Next is the mantle of history. There's a lot of tradition out here at this site. And then finally, the last answer is the answer you get when you ask somebody, why do they climb a mountain? Just because we can. So let's talk about the location. If you're familiar with the North Carolina Outer Banks, you know that there are a 200 mile long string of barrier islands on the North Carolina Atlantic coast. This is a beautiful area. There are beautiful beaches there. There's great sport fishing, pristine natural wildlife refuges. People have been flocking to the Outer Banks for years and years and years. There's also a lot of history here. There's a lot of tradition. It goes all the way back to 1846 when a breach blew open the original, uh, when a storm blew open the original breach in the Outer Banks here, creating the Oregon Inlet. For many, many years, the only way to get across Oregon Inlet was by ferry. Well, that changed in 1960, uh, 1963 when the department completed the construction of the original Herbert C. Bonner Bridge. They were out there in about two years starting to do repairs. This is a really nasty place to have a bridge. It was a maintenance nightmare for NCDOT for basically five, five plus decades. Uh, to add insult to injury, back in 1990, a dredge broke loose during a storm, struck the bridge, took out several spans, cut off access for many months. And it was around that time that NCDOT got really serious about coming up with a long-term solution, a replacement for the Bonner Bridge. Even that took a long time. It wasn't until 2011 when a design build team led, coincidentally enough, by PCL, good guys, a very, very good professional organization, won the uh, contract to do a design-build replacement of the Bonner Bridge. Finally, that last answer to the question, why are we building a bridge here? Just because we can, because we're engineers and we love a challenge. There were certainly many a challenges at this site. There were lots of constraints that we're working against. We had very loose, sandy soils, not necessarily the best for bridge foundations. Lots of problems with scour that had come along with that loose, sandy soil in this marine environment. And we had a lot of people trying to tell us what to do. There were a lot of stakeholders who all wanted to tell us how to design and build this bridge. Everybody had different goals, sometimes competing goals. NCDOT, for their part, wanted a very durable bridge, one that could last a long time in this harsh marine environment with very little maintenance. PCL, for their part, wanted a very constructible bridge, one that could be built very easily and quickly in this harsh marine environment. And then finally, everybody wanted an economical bridge, one that could be built for a reasonable price. Now, I mentioned scour and the loose sandy conditions. If you know Oregon Inlet, you know that the bathymetry there is highly dynamic, and that's a very technical term to say the sand's always moving around. And to kind of illustrate this and bring it home a little bit, I wanted to walk you through a little bit of history. This is a series of aerial photographs dating back from 1996. And as we walk through here, you're gonna see what happens to Oregon Inlet over time. Now, as you're looking at this, these series of photos, NC Highway 12 is running from the upper left to the lower right in the photo. In the upper left-hand corner is the south end of Body Island. The lower right-hand corner is the north end of Hatteras Island. And that kind of sharp edge on the north end of Hatteras Island is a rock revetment called the Terminal Groin that was built back in the 90s to help prevent further migration of the inlet to the south. We've marked, marked the uh, uh, existing bridge's navigation span so that you can have a point of reference. If you look real closely there, you can see the fender system. And as we walk through time, you can see that Oregon Inlet changes pretty dramatically. The inlet gets narrower, gets wider, the south end of Body Island migrates further to the south, it retreats to the north. It's changing all the time. 
This is one of my favorite photos. It was taken in the spring of 2011. We were right in the middle of the pre-bid engineering work, the pursuit phase of the design build project. And you can see that the south end of Body Island has migrated so far to the south that it's actually blocking the navigation span completely. If you look real close, you can see the Corps of Engineer dredge. It's working one span to the south as furiously as it can, trying to maintain any kind of navigation passageway. Not to fear. Hurricane Irene came along a few months later, blew the inlet wide open again. This happens all the time out at the Outer Banks. It's kind of crazy. It's, it's a really nasty place to have a bridge. So that gives you a little bit of background, some of the constraints we were up against, some of the conditions that we were fighting. And now I want to take a look back in history for a little bit longer and talk about the old Bonner Bridge. And I've titled this intentionally le Unintentionally Less Durable. And again, no discredit to the original designers. You have to remember when things were going on, what was going on, and what was the mindset back then. This was the early 1960s. This was the interstate era. We weren't thinking about building durable bridges. We were thinking about building a lot of bridges as fast as we can. We weren't thinking about long-term maintenance. We were thinking about lane miles. All of this was the mentality, build, 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 let's get going. Um, and also, the state of knowledge was quite a bit different. This was 60-plus years ago when they were designing this bridge. And I want to focus basically on three aspects of the design here, durability of concrete structures, scour, and vessel collision. And we'll kind of do a little comparison between the 1960s and today. So if you start thinking about durability of concrete structures and you recognize that the Bonner Bridge was built in a harsh marine environment, we're basically right on the Atlantic Ocean. We're in salt water. There's salt spray. There's salt water in the air all the time. It's a really nasty place for concrete. But when they designed and built the original Bonner Bridge, they weren't necessarily thinking about that. They just built another regular bridge. So the results, kind of what you would expect. There was a lot of deterioration. It occurred very rapidly. It occurred continuously over the life of that structure. NCDOT was out there all the time over the 50 plus years that the bridge was owned. Tim's sitting here, nodded his head. He probably went through a lot of uh, miserable experiences coming up with repairs for this bridge. And patched the patches. Patched the patches, exactly. Spent a lot of money uh, just keeping this bridge barely in service. Scour was another big problem with the bridge. This was probably the one main problem that was the, the Achilles heel of the original Bonner design. Back in the 1960s, we didn't have a lot of understanding about scour, at least not how to quantify it. We knew that things scoured up, but we didn't necessarily know how to come up with a scour depth accurately and reliably. Um, and scour wasn't really considered very seriously in the design of the original Bonner Bridge. If you look at the, uh, the image in the upper right, this is from the FHWA website. It was a study that was done. They were modeling scour around the bridge, and you can see that kind of red area near the bottom of the piles on one of the bends. Anything from the top of that red area on down indicates below the scour critical elevation. And you can see that the bottom of the channel is way below the top of that red mark. These piers were ser seriously undermined. What did you have to do to fix that? Well, you built a lot of crutch bents. There are lots and lots of crutch bents on the old Bonner Bridge. There were, I don't know, I, don't, I never stopped to count Tim. Tim doesn't even know either. He probably has nightmares about it. Um, but they'd come in and they'd have to bolster up the old bent caps, knock in a bunch of great big long piles and try to hold up these bents to the point that sometimes the old piles were hanging off the bridge rather than supporting the bridge. Finally, I wanted to talk briefly about vessel collision. Again, back in the 60s, we knew that bridges could get hit by boats, but we didn't necessarily know how to quantify it, and we didn't necessarily deal with it in the design. And that was the case here. There was limited understanding. It wasn't necessarily very uh, serious consideration in the design. And the result, when you hit the bridge, things fall down. And this is what happened back in 1990. A dredge broke loose during a storm. There was a big nor'easter. Dredge broke loose from its moorings. It was unmanned, hit the bridge, took out a half a dozen spans and cut off access for a long time across Oregon Inlet. So that was all unintentional. The designers never meant for any of that to happen. They just, they didn't know what they didn't know. Over time, based on experience, based on advancing the state of knowledge, we know a lot more now. And as NCDOT approached replacing the Bonner Bridge, they were very deliberate. They wanted to design and build a very durable bridge. They made a lot of specific choices with regard to durability of concrete structures, with regard to scour, and regard to vessel collision. And we'll try to walk through those now as we look at the design for the Basnight Bridge. Now, keep in mind all these conditions and constraints that we're working against. Always keep in mind we're building a big bridge. It's 2.8 miles long. We wanted to have a lot of economy, a lot of economy of scale if we could. 
We're working in a very limited remote location, limited access out there. If you're coming overland, the only way to get here is on NC Highway 12, which is a little two-lane road. Everything else is coming over water. We had three different uh, construction areas. We had land construction at the north and south end of the bridge. We had a long stretch of the bridge that was built over a submerged aquatic vegetation bed, an area with uh, shallow water and some uh, environmentally sensitive seagrasses. And then we had deep water construction out in the inlet. We were trying to build a bridge that accommodated navigation. There was a 2,400 foot wide navigation zone requirement. Anywhere in that 2,400 feet, the bridge had to have a minimum vertical clearance of 70 feet um, and a minimum horizontal clearance of 200 feet. The rest of the bridge was down with a 22 foot minimum clearance to keep it above wave action. Now we did have a few things working in our favor. We had that loose sandy soil, but at least the subsurface profile was relatively consistent. That was something we were able to use to our advantage. We were designing for scour. There are five different scour regions, as you'll see in a minute. Vessel collision forces, faster currents, two and a half uh, feet per second, and a higher than normal design wind speed, 105 miles per hour. And this is under the old Ashto fastest mile of wind measurement system. Addressing the durability of concrete structures, NCDOT right out the gate in the RFP was very deliberate, had a lot of prescriptive requirements, and they're starting out with a requirement to have a 100-year service life. This is the first 100-year service life bridge designed in North Carolina. Um, they prohibited the use of structural steel for girders and piles. Had lots of bad experiences with corrosion out there right over the inlet. Any cast-in-place concrete had to be reinforced with solid stainless steel reinforcing, all that nice shiny reinforcing you see in the photos there. At the time, stainless steel reinforcing cost four to five times on a per pound basis um, the cost of regular carbon steel. They did allow that for precast elements, you could use regular carbon steel, that black reinforcing, that'll become important in a minute. Um, any of the post tensioning that was in the splash zone up to about 12 and a half feet above mean high water was required to be solid stainless steel. And then most importantly, they had a very prescriptive concrete mix design. Lots of requirements here, 25% fly ash or 40% ground granulated blast furnace slag, 5% silica fume in the uh, footings and the columns, and the use of calcium nitrate corrosion inhibitor. So really, really robust concrete mix design, very resistant to chloride penetration, very durable. It's also very, very hard to work with in the field. So you can start to see where we're heading with this. This led early on to an emphasis on the use of extens the extensive use of precast elements all throughout the bridge. Using precast elements allowed us to minimize the use of uh, the quantities of that very expensive stainless steel reinforcing it allowed us to achieve much higher quality fabrication. Elements are being fabricated off-site under controlled conditions, not out in that harsh marine environment. This led to a lot better durability of the structure, also gave us a lot of other benefits, much more reliable delivery to that remote location, less field work for PCL out in Oregon Inlet, out in that marine environment. They were able to build faster, they were able to build safer, they were able to build to a much higher level of quality because they're doing less work in that saltwater environment. All of this also had the benefit of greatly reduced environmental impacts. So to that end, we precast everything we could, not just the girders and the piles, but also the bent caps and the columns. And remember, we're trying to build this big bridge. I talked about economy of scale before, and we tried to key into that and emphasize the use of simple elements and repetitive elements and try to minimize the number of those different elements. There's really only two main foundation elements used on the bridge, 54 inch precast cylinder piles and 36 inch uh, precast square piles. Three different substructure configurations, some pile bents, some two column bents, and single column segmental bents. And you'll see some of these all in a few minutes. Two basic superstructure types, most of the bridge used 96 inch deep Florida I-beam girders. And then in that high level long span navigation region, we had a variable depth precast post tension segmental concrete box girder superstructure. So we took those few pieces and we looked at the entire project. It was broken up into a number of different design regions based on the characteristics of each one of those areas, the scour depth, uh, the vessel collision requirements, the span length requirements, and so forth. And we're able to kind of puzzle together a design that used just those few elements, but combined in ways that really tailored the design to the unique needs of each one of those regions. And I mentioned scour in the five different scour regions. Uh, you can see here a, a longitudinal plot of the bridge that shows the subsurface conditions. You can see how things were relatively consistent. The pink is a good, hard, dense uh, sand that we were trying to reach. It comes along at basically two levels. You can see the scour profiles there. The uh, red scour is the 100-year scour. And out near the middle of the bridge in scour region three, 
that extends to 84 feet below mean high water. So this is pretty, ser pretty serious stuff. These uh, minimum required scour depths were based on some studies that were done by Parsons Brinkerhoff back in the early 90s for one of the uh, early designs for the bridge. So in addition to that 84 foot deep scour that we're trying to design for that minimum scour depth criteria, NCDOT also had a lot of other requirements. They wanted to see very refined 2D coastal hydraulic modeling, so they had uh, an adequate picture of the flow through the area here, the most current scour equations, and then on top of all of that, they wanted it all backed up with a little bit of proof, some physical model scour tests. So what you see in the photo here is a, a, a picture of a couple of the, uh, the uh, models that were being run up at the flumes at Colorado State University. Up in the upper left is one of the old bridges uh, foundations. You can see the spindly piles. You can see a crutch bent system there. And then off to the right was one of our preliminary designs for the new bridge foundations. Anytime I got nervous, worried that we weren't doing enough to make the bridge durable enough, robust enough, safe enough, I'd pull out these photos and they made me feel a whole lot better. You can look at that foundation on the right and you just look, it's much more stable, it's much more robust than the original design. When you're looking at scour, you're thinking about more than just the axial capacity of the pile. You're also thinking about lateral capacity of the entire system. And we had a strong focus on lateral analysis here because of that deep scour depth, because of the very large lateral forces that we had. Um, and that keyed us into doing a lot of soil structure interaction analysis using FB Multipeer. We were able to get really good refined pictures of the response of the structure, different scour depths, different lateral loading conditions. We were able to come in and have a much higher confidence that we were establishing um, good minimum tip elevations so that the structure would be able to withstand that deep scour and all the loads that are going to be thrown at it. And this is a pretty comprehensive set of loads when you think about it. We have vessel collision forces, wave forces, uh, stream flow, that two and a half foot per second uh, current that we're dealing with, the wind loads, especially on these higher structures with, the, with big deep superstructure depths, and creep shrinkage and thermal effects. One of the things we did with the design was to reduce the number of expansion joints. John keyed into this on uh, his project as well. Reduces maintenance quite a bit. It also results in very long continuous units. This uh, navigation span that's uh, shown up here on the slide was 3,550 feet long, once big long continuous unit. Even the fib girder spans were up to uh, 900 plus feet in uh, continuous unit length for many of the units. So all of these effects, all of these horizontal forces are pushing around these structures with deep scour on top of it. So I'm gonna walk you through some of the different designs just region by region. We'll show you a couple of photos just to show you how things uh, turned out. The north and south approach spans are those low level regions. The north approach span is a very big portion of the bridge. It's about a mile and a half of the total structure. So this is a pretty significant part of the, uh, the design. We had a cast in place concrete deck with all that stainless steel reinforcing was supported by precast, uh, pre-stressed Florida I-beam girders. I mean, that was all resting on an all precast pile bent system. Precast bent caps and precast vertical cylinder piles. Very easy to build, all precast, very durable uh, in this harsh marine environment. Those bent caps were a, a challenge in and of themselves. A lot of them were being delivered to the site overland, the ones that were gonna be built from land or out in the submerged, submerged aquatic vegetation region. The weight of those bent caps is pretty, pretty large and they're a very small footprint. So in order to make them easier to transport, the uh, precaster wanted to use some very large voids in there. Um, you can start to see where that's gonna impact the design, more of that stainless steel reinforcing, but it was a necessity to be able to get these things shipped overland. A lot of the bent caps out in the transition span regions, um, those could be uh, solid. They were coming in by barge. We didn't have quite those same weight limitations. But we did have a lot of repetitive details here. By keeping a lot of those bent caps the same, the same size, the same parameters, the precaster was really able to economize and improve their quality. They were able to invest in things like uh, reusable metal forms, things like that that really helped them to improve the quality of the work that they were producing. Once you get out there and start building, especially in the north approach span, PCL was working from a work trestle. They were leapfrogging that along as they advanced construction of the new bridge from the north end further to the south. They eventually got to the point where the Works, the uh, work trestle had reached its maximum length. They started picking up spans from the tail end, leapfrogging them up to the front, really reduced the environmental impacts. But it cut off land access. Everything's coming in now from the old bridge. Um, and it's a really limited workspace. So they're bringing in all of these precast pieces, taking them off the truck, setting them into place. That precast aspect of it, and in, in addition to re improving the durability, really helped them a lot um, with all the, uh, the construction aspects of things. 
I wanted to talk a little bit about the, uh, the FIB girders as well. They were used both in the north and south approach spans and in the transition spans. And they were all designed for zero tension um, under service load conditions. This is fairly common in North Carolina now. It's done on all of the bridges in the coastal environment. But it keeps the concrete in compression through all of those different service conditions that really minimizes the amount of cracking and improves the durability of the superstructure. So as we go into that north and south transition span regions, this is where we're going from the low level approach spans up to the high level navigation unit. We have that same superstructure, the cast in place concrete deck with the stainless steel reinforcing the, uh, the, the pre-stressed fib girders. Now we're sitting though on a two column bent system. It has a precast bent cap, precast post tension square columns, and all of that is resting on a cast in place footing with multiple battered uh, of those 36 inch square piles. We had to switch the foundation type here because we're getting out into deeper water, deeper scour, and picking up more of the vessel collision forces. So we needed a more robust foundation system here. So a couple of photos showing the uh, construction of the south transition span region. All of this work is now being done off the barges. We're out in Oregon Inlet, and we're building big pieces. The spans here were up to 182 feet. These are some of the longest simple span precast girders in North Carolina. Construction of these big foundations is no mean feat, and I really have to hand it to PCL. They were very creative uh, and very, very gifted at being able to come up with clever ways to build these foundations reliably, accurately, um, and, and to a high level of quality. I just wanted to highlight one aspect of it. When they're knocking in these 36 inch square piles on a two on 12 batter, you think, oh, that's no problem, no big deal. It's a real challenge, especially out there in the inlet. PCL came up with this really nice system, big steel template, and then they would come in with these 60 inch diameter steel casings, vibrate those down into the sand, which they could do very accurately. Once those casings are in place, they could airlift out the uh, sand that was inside the casing, take those big piles that are up to 130 feet long, trip them over into those casings, turn on the jets, jet them down to close to their final tip elevation, and then get the big diesel hammer and drive them the rest of the way to their final tip elevation and axial resistance requirements. Once they had all the piles in place, they had to start building the waterline footings. Again, no mean feet. Some of these footings are up to eight feet thick, planned dimensions up to 50 feet in some cases, and it's all reinforced with solid stainless steel reinforcing. There's a lot of stainless steel rebar out here. Finally, we get up to the, uh, the sexy part of the bridge, the high level long span navigation regions. This is where we have that precast post tension variable depth segmental concrete box girder superstructure supported on single column bents in this case with a precast bent cap, precast hollow uh, post tension box columns, and again resting on a similar cast in place footing with multiple battered square piles. Superstructure construction went fairly rapidly, fairly quickly, was all done balanced cantilever uh, erection method. Um, PCL would bring in, the bar bring in barges with multiple segments on them. They had custom segment erectors they had built for the project. Um, they're just knocking this stuff out, cantilevering out 175 feet in either direction. If you ever have a chance to go and see this kind of work in the field, I really encourage you to do so. It's pretty dramatic, kind of scary when you look at it, but uh, they know what they're doing and it went, uh, went very well. So just as a quick recap, um, we started with a basic question, why are we building a bridge here? Just to give you a little bit of background, show you a little bit about what we were up against as we were approaching the design and construction of this bridge. We took a look back at the old Bonner Bridge, how the designers at the time didn't know what they didn't know and came up with a design that was maybe a little bit less durable than it could have been, but it was par for the course. Uh, it was a uh, state of the art, I should say, at the time. And then we come along many years later and we're designing the Bass Knife Bridge. A lot more experience under the belt of the department. That They know what they want. They know how to get a durable bridge. And they made a lot of very specific, very deliberate choices uh, to make sure that this bridge would last for a long time. Just a couple of statistics here, real quick. One day, our geotechnical engineers were sitting around. They were apparently bored. I didn't give them enough to do that day. They started counting up all the number of the elements they designed. They figured out that they had designed 532 of those 36 inch square piles, over 12 miles of precast concrete pile length, um, 137 of the 54 inch cylinder piles, another three and a half miles. Well, at this point, the structural engineers got jealous. They had to stop working and start counting up what they designed. 62 precast columns, 69 precast bent caps, 300 plus of those precast concrete fib girders, over nine, almost nine miles of uh, precast girder length, and then almost three quarters of a mile of that segmental concrete box girder structure. 
add it all up, it's almost 26 miles of precast concrete. If you look at things on a volume basis, the bridge has about 90,000 cubic yards of concrete and two thirds of it was precast. And that was all deliberate. They got us a lot better construction quality, a lot more durability in this really harsh saltwater environment. A couple of milestones. We finished the design up right around the beginning of 2013 or so. The project went on hold for a little while as the department worked out some ongoing litigation. Um, eventually, they were able to cut PCL loose to begin construction in 2016. Uh, back in 2019, uh, they had a community day. We were able to open the bridge up in February, had a dedication ceremony in April of 2019. And then PCL wasn't done. They still had a lot of work to do. Demolishing the old bridge was not an easy task. Oregon Inlet did not want to let go of that bridge. They had a lot of problems with shoaling of the inlet. That bathymetry was fighting them every step of the way. They had a lot of issues getting access with the barges to the old bridge and then getting the barges out past the bar out to the offshore uh, artificial reef sites where they were depositing a lot of the demolition material. They kept working at it though and uh, they just uh, finished up not too long ago. Kudos to them. It was a long, long haul for everybody really involved in the project. But I think everybody's pretty, uh, pretty happy with the results. With that, I think, for questions? On your, uh, where you have your box girder sections, you have a precast um, column session coming up from the footing. Did you do any infilling of that? Did you put any kind of, um, any kind of concrete inside of that once those were, were put in place? No, no. Actually, the, uh, the bottom portion of that column is solid cast in place concrete up to a certain point. And then up above that, it's uh, precast and hollow. And it's left open. There's uh, access for inspection uh, that you can get in you can get into the uh, segmental box girder, walk along, and there's a hatch through the bottom flange of the box girder and then a hatch in the top of the precast cap. And there's um, basically eye bolts in there. You can rig up a rope access system and drop on down in there, which is what they've done, uh, at least in the first inspection. I know, Karen, I, did they do that in the second inspection as well? Okay, thank you. So yeah, you can get in there and it's, it's all open. Just for curiosity, you were talking regarding the uh durability of the concrete, uh, reinforced concrete. Mm -hmm. uh, and you said that it was designed for a 100 uh, year service life. Uh, did you guys use any particular software or modeling to determine the, the service life or it was based on, uh, on, on the materials used and so forth? Well, it was, the materials were basically prescribed, but we did do a service life analysis using now, you don't quote me on this. I can't remember because I get the two programs mixed up. There was Life 365 and then there's the other program that's used for concrete service life analysis. And I can't remember, whichever one it was, we used that and did a service life analysis that, that ran out the numbers, yes. Well, you're, you're asking a question that's over my de uh, out of my depth. <laughs> um, we did have, we have uh, corrosion engineers on staff and one of the corrosion engineers who was a concrete specialist had done all of that service life modeling. They considered the material properties, the mix design, um, the concrete cover thickness, all of that was uh, included in the analysis. I wish I could give you a better answer to the question. If you're really curious, I can get you uh, in contact with the person who did the analysis. So Dominic, where was all that precast work, uh, precast, and then how did it get from the yard out to the site? That's a good question, and um, it's, it was a little bit of, it was a mix. Uh, all the precasting was done up at uh, Coastal Precast Systems, which is up in Chesapeake, Virginia. Uh, they had both land access and over water access, so a lot of the structure that was being built from the work trestle, especially through the north approach spans, that big long area, uh, through the seagrass beds, and then the very south end of the bridge that was be being built from land. All of that material was coming in overland, so uh, Coastal would ship odd by truck the big 96 inch girders, um, the precast bent caps, all of those pieces, the cylinder piles, the square piles, anything that was gonna be built off the work trestle or off land was coming overland. Everything else came down the uh, intercoastal waterway by barge. Well, thank you very much. The preceding was produced by the National Center for Pavement Preservation. More information can be found on the web at pavementpreservation.org. Additional support provided by Michigan State University.